Hello everybody, welcome to the second episode of Monday with Mate. We got so many questions that we had to split up this episode in two. Today we are going to talk about the general uh, issues or challenges when creating a uh, hypercar. And next time we are going to talk about the specifics when creating an electric hypercar. James asked on YouTube, what did your family say when you came up with the idea for Rimac? So all my friends thought I was completely nuts. They didn't believe me that I was going to achieve it. And to whomever I talked about it, they were like, okay, it will never going to happen. It's just like a crazy dream. Uh, my mother actually, I think, was telling until I had like 20 employees that I should finish my college, find, it, find a normal job and like stop screwing around with, with cars. So I think nobody took me serious. Uh, and I remember I also went to the University of Mechanical Engineering in Zagreb uh, to ask them for advice because they were the closest people to having any automotive uh, connection in, in Croatia. And when I told them what I wanted to do, they told me it's impossible to create a car in Croatia. The sooner you give up, the less people will go under with you. So nobody really believed in this uh, and I had to prove many people wrong. So, to develop a hypercar, first you need skills. You need to know the technical challenges and the engineering behind creating such a car. We started out in Croatia, where there was not really a car industry before. Uh, there was never a car developed in this country, so there wasn't any know-how. So how do you start? We started by trying. Trial and error, uh, first with the E30 with my old BMW that we started. Well, it's a 1984 car but we, I converted it to an electric car first time in 2009, 2010. From there on, I started to assemble a team and we started to build the Concept One. And of course, at the beginning, we had absolutely no idea what we were doing. We were doing everything wrong, but there was nobody else to do it for us. We couldn't afford to pay other people. So the small team of a few guys that were working on it, we built the first car. And all of us did it for the first time and it wasn't too bad for our first attempt but it was light years away from what the C2 is today. So we started to work for other car companies. We learned a lot through that. Uh, we had to survive as a company, so we had to have revenues uh, and projects we were doing for other companies from the very beginning. And by doing so much stuff with other car companies, we learned to be uh, very fast and flexible. And we had this attitude of, okay, we don't know what we were doing, so it's okay to fail, it's okay to make a mistake as long as we are open about it and learn about the mistakes we make and learn along the way. And over the years, the team has grown from the initial few people to later dozens and hundreds, now to over 600 people in the company. Now we have a very international team. We have people that came from other car companies, from Ferrari, from Tesla, from Toyota, whatever. Um, and they brought in their knowledge and experience. And we started quite early developing batteries and powertrains and those things that are new for the industry. So it's tough to catch the big car companies with stuff they are doing for 100 years, like, I don't know, lights or doors or stuff like that. For those kind of things, you can hire people that have some experience from previous companies or you try to catch the big car companies and be as good as them in those things. But luckily we started with the new stuff that was relatively new for everybody actually, like high performance batteries, powertrains and so on. And we started quite early in 2009, 2010. And because of that, we had an edge, an advantage over that with other uh, companies. So there was nobody we could hire that knows about batteries or stuff like that. So we became the experts in that. And that was what funded the company because that was what we were doing for other car companies. But in reality, why I started a company was to do this, our own car. So after years of development for other companies and the experience with the BMW and then later with uh, this Concept One, we had an initial team that had the know-how to start the C2 development. But still, after we started the C2 development until now, we have again expanded the team a lot, learned a lot more, we have introduced a lot of new tools, a lot of new engineering methodologies, and now we, are, we have the capability to actually develop such a product, which is super hard. A car is a little bit less regulated than an airplane, but in terms of complexity, it's actually more complex. It's one of the most complex products that you can design and build, and especially such a new one. 
Then the second challenge is approach that we had to develop everything from scratch. So usually when you develop a car, a car company would start from an existing platform. So I don't know, for the uh, BMW 8 series, you would start with the 5 series and start from there. Here, we didn't take over anything. So um, it's, it has zero carryover from the Concept 1 or from any other car. So we started from a blank sheet of paper. Everything is different. So for example, the Concept 1 had a welded steel aluminum structure. This one is a complete carbon fiber monocoque. The wheelbase is different, the dimensions are different, the homologation is completely different. And, and we didn't just start from scratch with the platform, but actually with every part. So even things, small things like pumps and fans were specifically developed for this car. Everything is from scratch developed for it. So the big parts like the chassis, the suspension, the powertrain, the battery pack, the inverters, the motors, the gearboxes, everything is specifically developed for this car. But even small bits and pieces like all the control units, uh, all the pumps, uh, all the interior features, the buttons, the... we didn't want any buttons uh, from other cars. So the challenge of developing so many things from ground up, many of the things we did for the first time, that was a huge challenge as well. For the prototypes, for the crash testing and all of that, it's a lot, a lot of millions. That was a major area of what I did and what enables us to do this. And luckily we have partners like Hyundai and Porsche who have invested big amounts of money into the company, uh, over 150 million euros at this point, to be able to do this. Tokoza asked, what are the challenges of international homologation? So we didn't want to take any shortcuts. With the Concept 1, we didn't have a homologized car, so it's like a single type approval, and in the US it's a, a show and display car, which means every single car has to go through some specific procedure and it's not fully crash tested. With the C2, we didn't want to do that, we wanted to do it properly, so it's on a completely different level. We are doing global homologation for EU, US, which means there is no exception, so we have to crash many of these cars, um, regardless if it's a small volume production. So we are building dozens of cars that will go through thousands of tests. Uh, crash tests, uh, uh, temperature tests, humidity tests, all kinds of different tests to make sure it's safe and it fulfills all the regulations. So we are doing the full crash testing program uh, with many different cars. I think the final number of cars that we will crash is something like 15, 16 cars that uh, will be repaired over and over again. So for example, we would start with a lower speed impact in the front, uh, 24 kilometers per hour just for the, for the crash structure, then we would repair the crash structure, do a, a 36 km per hour uh, crash test, then we would repair the crash structure again and do the full 62 km per hour, uh, full into rigid barrier, into basically concrete wall, then the front can't be repaired anymore, then you do a rear crash test with the same car, but still using the car over and over again, uh, we have to crash something like 15 or 17 cars in total. Um, which is a big crash testing program because we wanted to do it really properly. We have to even test things that you wouldn't consider, like for example there's regulations uh, for the interior, how sharp things can be, how stiff things can be, like for example we have these big two buttons to adjust the torque factoring and the uh, power distribution front and rear in the car in the center and that is, that's a potential hazard, so if you hit your head against it you could injure yourselves. So actually that part is designed to absorb energy in a very specific way. So when you hit your head against it, that it will collapse or break off in a very specific way, but it still has to be stiff enough that you can't break it off with your hand. So we even test things like this. So a head dummy is fired against many different points in the vehicle, in the interior, roof, A pillar, door, to make sure that a head cannot be injured. So even hypercars have to go through things like this, which you wouldn't expect maybe for a hypercar, but it's exactly the same kind of requirements like for a mass-produced car like the Volkswagen Golf, let's say. The Hamster GT asked, how were you able to source the modern technology when building the C1? So this is also the winner of the shirt with this question. At that time, the technology didn't really exist, like you couldn't go out and buy a one megawatt uh, battery for, for a car. So that, that were the things that we were focusing on, like to develop uh, the technologies and the components that could actually support the idea of creating an all-electric hypercar. And um, it, it basically didn't exist, so a lot of these things we had to uh, develop on our own. 
And that was what we were all about, to like push the limits. And in order to push the limits, you couldn't cook with the same water like everybody else. We had to develop a lot of the stuff on our own. So we focused on that part. And on the other aspects, probably, you know, because it was the first time we were doing it and we didn't have the money, we didn't have the experience, we didn't have the time and so on. We, we weren't as good as others in many aspects, but on the electric part, it was really, I think, at that time pushing the limits. Maybe the biggest challenge is paying for all of it. So fundraising is a big, big topic. And personally, it's maybe the thing that I'm doing most to make sure the company survives and has the money to pay for the bills and for the salaries and everything. Uh, so we have big investors now on board, like Porsche and Hyundai. That came in the recent two years, basically. But to come to that position where we would be interesting for companies like that, it was a long, long way to go where we slowly built up the company and just made month after month, survived week after week and didn't know if the company will still exist next week. So we were really, really struggling, especially at the beginning. So fundraising is a major topic and maybe we'll make another video about it separately. But uh, that's basically, you know, money is or cash is the blood of every company. And if you don't have it, the best ideas and the best engineers in the world won't, won't help. Developing a car like this is very expensive. So you have to pay for tooling, for engineers, for the facilities. There were many, many questions asking if you'll ever produce a mass-produced car. I get that question a lot, especially in Croatia, if we can make a car that's affordable for Croatians. Well, first of all, uh, there's many companies trying to do that. So there's all the big car companies are trying to make an affordable electric car. And you have really good electric cars that are semi-affordable, I would say right now, like a Renault um, Zoe or a Nissan Leaf or cars like that. And we can see how Tesla, after billions and billions of investments and 15 years and the smartest people in the world with 35,000 employees, um, are struggling to make a competitive and cheap electric car. It's really, really tough to do that. And there are several reasons why we won't do that directly, but we will contribute to that with other car companies. So first of all, we are focused on high performance. And that's where we are best at. And we don't want to compete with other car companies uh, in things that they are doing for 100 years. So a big car company, like for example, Hyundai, they have four times the revenue of Croatia's GDP. So one single car company is four times bigger than all of Croatia, all of its companies, everything combined. They are producing millions of doors and lights and seats and so on. So it's impossible to compete with them in terms of pricing and the supply chain that they have built over the decades and so on. So we want to be the best in high performance electric cars and help companies like Hyundai to build also higher volume, uh, exciting electric cars. So you will see our technology in a lot of cars that are more affordable, maybe not the cheapest ones on the market, but more affordable for a wider audience because as you know, Hyundai, which is our partner, doesn't produce a million euro hypercars. They produce more affordable vehicles and you will see some of our technology in their cars. Um, so we hope that we will uh, be able through partnerships, not against other car companies, but with them, uh, see this technology from this car, for example, trickling down into more mainstream vehicles. But we on our own, we will not produce uh, mass-produced vehicles. And another reason for that is also because I truly believe that in the next couple of decades, uh, vehicle ownership will largely disappear. There will be a niche market for people who love cars, who will always want to own their own car, drive their own car. But for the mass market, I believe that the solution in the next couple of decades will be that people don't buy cars and don't drive them anymore, but the cars are used as a mobility service um, where you get picked up by a car autonomously, the car drives you where you want to go. It's cheap, comfortable, convenient, safe. It will save millions of lives. It will save millions of tons of CO2. It will save billions of hours because it will be more efficient. Uh, so it will be a win-win and that comes from a car guy. I'm a car guy as you know, but I think for the regular drive and commute it makes much more sense to have autonomous vehicles that are not owned by people because when people own cars they stand around for 97% of the time. It's a huge waste of resources. So because we want to focus on the high performance and because I truly believe that cars, that the vast majority of cars in the future will not have a steering wheel, we want to uh, focus on, on, on where we are best at and not going to the mass market on our own.
That was it for today. Thank you for tuning in. And as always, please ask your questions and leave comments. And maybe because I was talking about autonomous driving today, that was my opinion of how the future will look like. Please let us know what you think the future of transport will look like.